Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about modeling endotherm niche with, of course, dynamic energy budget theory. Um, I'm your host, Marco Yusup, currently an assistant professor at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. Let's uh, begin slowly. So we can let's start with the question, why is dynamic energy budget theory useful? And if somebody asks you, you may already have an answer because, okay, you are here, here to learn, but I also assume that you've done at least a little bit of studying, a little bit of work. And uh, a solid answer that might come to mind is the depth theory can predict uh, organismal ontogeny. So that would be growth, maturation, reproduction, and uh, in part, at least survival. And uh, in fact, depth theory can do so throughout the full life cycle, uh, depending, so independence on uh, environmental conditions, which means food, temperature, toxicants, and whatnot. And that's a fine answer. Uh, and indeed, I've been uh, in that phase, just uh, as, as you are now, and I, I've done the same with my favorite pet. You can see it here on the right side. Uh, this is uh, the magnificent bluefin tuna, and personally, the coolest pet uh, there, there is. But uh, yeah, th that was my first step into uh, dynamic energy budgets. And indeed, uh, we have been successful in modeling not just the full life cycle of Pacific bluefin tuna, which was my primary uh, target, but also Atlantic bluefin tuna, skipjack uh, tuna, and we have done some uh, nice comparisons. Um, so what, what we mean by full life cycle in ontogeny, essentially from an egg to an adult individual and then uh, its eggs again. And uh, by doing so for tunas, we, we learned some really cool stuff. So that's by doing this kind of mechanistic modeling, we can learn the cool stuff about our uh, organism because we are connecting to, to processes and to mechanisms. It's called mechanistic modeling for a reason. And what we learned about uh, tunas is that com in comparison to, to many, to most species which kind of follow this uh, body size scaling relationship where uh, reserve capacity increases with body size. Tunas are actually very large, but have very small reserve. And on top of that, they also have high expenditure. So very um, kind of um, fast lifestyle. And these characteristics in large part uh, are consequences of early, so what we learned that th th these characteristics really arise from early life on the genetic developments which have both effects on ecology of these species and on uh, their evolution. So it's, it's really cool, cool stuff. But uh, still, should we think bigger? Can we solve bigger problems? And some of the stuff that we would like to address with this sort of mechanistic modeling uh, that the, the, the depth theory provides is, for example, uh, figuring out uh, body size scaling relationships that pervade the ecology and essentially so this would be a, a prime example where we have body mass on the horizontal axis metabolic rate on the vertical axis and uh, we see a very nice regular re relationship that we actually want to understand based on, on processes and mechanisms that, that are behind it that drive this sort of relationship and in this particular example this was actually done without really fitting so it was done using depth theory but without really fitting uh, the curve to the data meaning that uh, we were able to so so not just not just fit the data well, but we were actually able to start from first principles and come uh, to something that is really good approximation of patterns that we see uh, in uh, environment. Another example, uh, ideal example is uh, that now in use, there are about 20 million chem different chemicals in use and about 1 million uh, chemicals is added per year. The number of uh, chemicals that whose, whose effects, whose toxic effects have been tested in laboratories is in the range of uh, 10,000. So it's pretty hopeless task that you will ever be able to test everything in laboratories. And even worse, uh, in, in, in environment chemicals uh, mix and uh, or same organism can be exposed to multiple uh, chemicals, chemical compounds. So if we are ever to hope to, to have any understanding of how these chemicals and then especially mixtures and compounds might affect uh, organisms in, in the environment, we need to start uh, predicting things using, again, mechanistic modeling 
because that can also give us ins insight into uh, processes and mechanisms that are behind the effects that we are observing. And what kind of uh, predictions I have in mind in particular is kind of nicely seen in this graph where we fit the model to data that to this dotted data. Well, uh, dotted curves are fitted to the data. And then we start doing predictions, these solid curves uh, down here. So we make predictions completely out of the range at which for which the model was fitted and it can still get uh, pretty good results. And that's the sort of thing that we uh, must aim towards in order to be able to, to uh, make out any sense of all this uh, tremendous number of chemicals that are around. Yet another thing is that we want to connect um, different levels uh, or different scales of metabolic or biological organization. So here we see uh, turtles and uh, see marine turtle and this turtle uh, oftentimes mistakes plastics for food. Uh, also, this is not necessarily lethal for the turtle, but it does, plastic does not really uh, have any energetic value for, for the turtle, which means it is competing with food for uh, the capacity, for digestive capacity. And depending on uh, how plastics, so how plastic is pervasive in the environment and how long it stays inside the digestive system, we can have different outcomes for individuals. So in, individuals can be smaller because they uh, uh, take assimilate less energy. Uh, they may even die. They may grow and reproduce, but the question is, is this really enough for population? Uh, for population growth to be positive, because if it's not, then the population will be declining in the long term. And though we have relatively, relatively healthy looking turtles, we might be losing uh, the population. Uh, yet another example is that uh, we want to also have, so, so we want to oftentimes we want to manage uh, ecosystems, ecosystem degradations, uh, environmental risks, and uh, mechanistic, we want to have mechanistic again understanding of processes and that, that are. So uh, to, to be able to model consequences of uh, human activities and especially uh, human, say, pollution, uh, chemicals that we release into the environment. So this is, of course, where uh, depth comes in and we can, uh, in fact, predict the effects of multiple stressors, most chemicals, so abiotic stressors like temperature, high temperature, or even biological stressors like uh, viruses or bacteria that are causing diseases. But, and from there we get, uh, biological perform ecological performance of uh, this organism of the individual. We can again relate that and we wish to relate that to uh, population level, but then when it comes to uh, human decision making and managing those these sorts of uh, environmental risks, um, well, essentially decision making comes, human decision making comes into play and oftentimes we need to build consensus and building consensus is, for example, something that uh, evolutionary game theory tries to analyze. And then we can have feedbacks between this sort of mechanistic modeling using DEB and uh, decision modeling using evolutionary game theory. And finally, uh, an example that I really want to stress out is let's say we, we collect all sorts of environmental data and then we want to put the data to good use and predict where a certain species uh, will appear or essentially survive and even prosper. And oftentimes uh, this is done using correlative models. So essentially statistics trying to predict some sort of probability densities uh, depending on environmental variables such as precipitation or temperature, uh, which is fine and, and nice, but it is process implicit. We don't really have uh, causative connections. We, we cannot really answer questions why maybe to some extent, but uh, processes are play a second, at best play a secondary role in this kind of approach. And this is, uh, this should be compared to mechanistic models, which is what we are interested in and what I've been uh, mentioning since the beginning. And you uh, could also, you, you probably have already seen uh, a lecture by uh, Mike Kearney, uh, which also addresses the same thing and in fact, the, the, you could, you could see the same slide there. But uh, the point being that mechanistic models are process explicit and that we make a, we are trying to make a direct connection to some processes and mechanisms that are underlying an organism's ontogeny. So, and, and that means growth, reproduction, maturation, reproduction, and in part survival. So uh, we are trying to put those processes and mechanisms 
that are behind autogeny, that are driving autogeny, kind of in, we, we try to give them uh, an important role, the main role, in fact, and then uh, try to predict where a species will survive and prosper. And this, of course, is really important in the context of climate change. So circumstances, environment is changing, uh, human activities are driving, actually making a change, making the change to be really fast. And that uh, prediction, having a predictive capability and having the ability to answer question why, question why is, is more important than ever. So how do we go about predicting where an organism survives uh, uh, and prospers? So uh, to do that, we actually need a combination of uh, biophysical ecology and metabolic theory. So first, just a little bit, of course, you are here to, to learn about metabolic theory and a specific, one specific metabolic theory, but we need to put, we need to give some context and uh, this connection with bio, biophysical uh, ecology is really important. So uh, let's, let's try to, let's look at that. Um, specifically, whether an organism is successful in a given environment will depend on um, well, whether it has enough food, uh, whether uh, it has enough water, and also whether it can uh, keep bo uh, body temperature within the desired range. Or with uh, endotherms, actually, we, we know that body temperature is uh, constant, but there are still some physical limitations to uh, what to environmental conditions in which endotherms can do. Uh, something like that. And we have to understand whether at a given location, environmental conditions are suitable uh, for, for our organism of interest to, to survive. So uh, to, for example, understand whether uh, an organism is getting enough uh, food, we need to consider food mass flow balance. So we are comparing uh, ingested food. Uh, we are actually looking how this is used for growth, how it's used for reproduction, what is stored and uh, the amounts that are ingested in the form of feces. Um, we, when, when we look at the water balance, again, some water is uh, ingested with food or directly, and then uh, it can be adjusted again with uh, feces or urinated or stored somewhere. And it also evaporates, well, through skin or well, really depending on the organism, but definitely through eyes, through uh, nose and uh, similar. And finally, there is heat flow balance that essentially uh, tries to is trying to compare uh, inputs of heat, for example, from direct solar radiation exposure exposure to sun sun rays, uh, infrared radiation which can be coming from the sky or from uh, the earth below, from the ground below, um, metabolic. Uh, heat production, so metabolism is one source of heat, and then uh, heat will leave the body through, again, in the form of infrared radiation, convection, uh, when there's wind, we feel colder, so that sort of uh, environmental conditions have affect um, these processes. Evaporation is there, of course, uh, conduction, and then internal energy is the last uh, kind of element in this balance, where if internal energy is changing, so the organism will either be increasing or decreasing temperature. Well, if, at least if we are talking about exotherm, endotherm, so they'll try to avoid that. And it's interesting that these uh, balances kind of intersect one another. So evap evaporation is important for heat balance, but it's also uh, obvious uh, kind of hmm, cause of water loss. And uh, similarly, uh, metabolism is important for food processing, but uh, Again, it enters the heat balance because uh, so metabolic heat. Metabolism is a source of heat that allows, uh, well, endotherms definitely to keep uh, temperature independent and above uh, the environmental temperature. So that's the sort of uh, context in, in which we are working. And our specific interest will be in uh, this uh, metabolic heat uh, right here. But let me explain why. So when we look at, uh, at an endotherm, what we know is that we know its core temperature. We also know uh, the air temperature. Here we will know also, we can also, we can measure all sorts of meteorological indicators. Um, what the problem is, is that we really don't know 
the temperature at the skin or uh, temperature at the uh, fur air interface. And to be able to calculate all the, so we, we actually want to calculate those temperatures. And then we also want to say what sort of metabolic heat generation is necessary to give this particular temperature profile. And to be able to do those calculations, we need to measure really all, all sorts of uh, things, all sorts of functional uh, traits. And then uh, what, what happens in particular uh, with endotherms and how they differ from uh, ectotherms is that if air temperature is, is in a kind of ideal range, then, uh, well, there is always some metabolism going on. There is like what is called a basic metabolic rate and, and uh, this heat will be produced because of the, this basal metabolism. But if air temperature drops below, uh, this ideal, ideal range called thermal uh, neutral zone or above that range, then in both cases, in both cases, endotherms will find a way to increase their metabolic rate in order to uh, keep the temperature, this core temperature inside constant. And uh, this is, uh, well, you know, in contrast to, to ectotherms, whose temperature really, uh, well, metabolic rate really here, given in terms of uh, oxygen consumption really depends. Uh, on, on temperature. And if temperature is going down, metabolic rate is simply going down. It, there is no, it's not possible for uh, metabolic rate to go, to go up. Um, so the problem, so to summarize really, and this is the only slide with a lot, with a lot of text because I, I want this to kind of, the, the problem to be cl clearly stated. So for endotherms, we know air and core temperatures, so body temperature and air temperature, but we don't know what happens at the skin and fur air interface. We don't know those temperatures and we don't know metabolic heat generation that are necessary to maintain these temperatures, to give the temperature profile that we are measuring. And uh, so heat, heat flow balance can solve this problem, but it also tells us only what metabolic heat generation should be, not if this is possible. And that is the place where uh, Deb enters into the picture. So Deb can tell us from first principles, again, it's mechanistic modeling. It can tell us what metabolic generation, heat generation really is. And then if there is mismatch from what we are, between what we are getting from Deb and uh, what we are getting from our uh, uh, heat balance, heat flow balance, then we have to ask, so there, there, could, be two, there could be two situations that actually what we are getting from the heat flow balance is lower than the basal metabolic rate. And that's a problem that really cannot be solved. Something in this environment doesn't work for, for the organism. And then another situation is where we could have high, large difference in the opposite direction. In which case we have to ask ourselves, is it possible for uh, the organism to increase its metabolic rate uh, to, to match what is needed? It can do this by changing posture. Uh, well, it can, not necessarily just increase its metabolic heat generation. It can adjust different factors in the uh, balance, in the heat flow balance, so that things kind of pan out. And it can do so. So there are a number of behavioral adjustments or physiological adjustments. This can be posture, panting, sweating, shivering, uh, basking in the sun or hiding in some burrow. Um, so, and if not, none of that works to really balance the, uh, the heat flow equation, properly, then we have to conclude that endotherms simply cannot survive in the given environmental conditions. All right, so from this moment on, I kind of please brace yourself. Things are going to get a bit theoretical. So far, it was more descriptive with nice pictures. Now we'll go a little bit into equation and we'll try to answer the question, how to calculate the metabolic heat generation using uh, depth. And to do that, we kind of need to go back to basics. We need to focus on what metabolism really means for us in kind of in the simplest possible way. So we are really trying to, to take the simplest, kind of paint the, sim the simplest possible picture and try to do a formal kind of derivation using physics with principles of thermodynamics to come up uh, with an expression for uh, metabolic heat generation. So in this kind of this simplest picture, we are dividing the organism into reserve and structure, the reserve being uh, buffer between the, the environment and the organism and allowing the organism, for example, to survive periods uh, without food. Structure is really what is necessary to keep the organism going. 
to, to find food and uh, simply to, to survive. Uh, reserve and structure differ also in, in uh, their need for maintenance. So reserve doesn't need maintenance, structure does need maintenance. Reserve is a sort of uh, kind of flow reactor or, or uh, kind of an object with an uh, entrance and exit. So food enters in and after a while comes out. So it has a natural turnover rate structure doesn't. So, uh, and it, because it doesn't, it's, it's structure, you know, it's, uh, it's conceptually different. It has only an input and we, all, we can only add more structure, but then the old structure would be subject to wear and tear. And uh, that's why it needs maintenance. It needs to be constantly repaired. Otherwise uh, it wouldn't last long simply. So the process, and then, uh, of course, organisms uh, will, aside so, so from the reserve and structure, we also want to keep track of how mature the organism is, whether it's, uh, well, an embryo, a juvenile, an adult. And there are three to, to kind of uh, capture, to, to connect these ideas of reserve structure and maintenance, or in maturity. Um, and maturity maintenance, and the idea that actually organisms use food for energy. So we need to consider three, uh, at least three processes, three metabolic processes. That is assimilation. So uh, food being converted into reserve. Then there is growth process, uh, growth metabolic process, so reserve being used to build structure. And finally, there is dissipation. So essentially reserve being used as an energy source, not necessarily, not to build anything. Um, so those are the three processes on which we'll focus. And uh, we start the formalization of, we start formalizing them uh, by writing down what is called macrochemical reactions. Three processes, there are three macrochemical reactions. Essentially, uh, the, the first one, the assimilation reaction is saying, okay, there is some food, an organic compound means it contains uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Could be other elements, but these four uh, comprise 99% of biomass. So uh, we, are, we are good if we just consider these four elements. So X is the here is the index uh, describing food, and then indices H, O, and N uh, stand for uh, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and usually carbon. We, we are working in C mode, so we always look at how the number of other atoms per one atom of carbon. So we have some food molecule here. We combine it with uh, oxygen and that produces one C mole of reserve. And then because this and this does not necessarily have uh, the same chemical composition, so we will have some uh, surpluses of uh, C O or H or N atoms. And that means that uh, CO2 so carbon dioxide, uh, water, and in this particular case, I'm considering ammonia. It doesn't have to be ammonia in terrestrial animals. It's actually uh, urea or urine is much more, well, it's, it's yeah, much more common to put it that way. But uh, mm, ammonia is conceptually simple, so it's an, it's an easiest example to use. And finally, during assimilation, some, during the digestion process, it's not a, uh, the process is not perfectly efficient, so some uh, feces is, pro is produced. And specifically, for each C mole of uh, reserve, we will produce YPE C moles of feces. This is just a chemical, mm, it's just a chemical reaction formalizing the idea that food is used to build reserve uh, for if we are considering. Uh, uh, aerobic organisms, then they will uh, use oxygen to drive uh, chemical reactions, and then uh, surpluses will be excreted in the form of CO2, H2O, or NH3. For uh, the growth reaction, we will now have, we will now not use food anymore. We will build a uh, structure from reserve. So we are taking one C mole of reserve, combining it with, with oxygen, and then we are looking how many C moles of structure we can produce. So V here in extending for uh, structure. This pretty much follows the conventions in the dev book. So that shouldn't be uh, too much of a problem. And then 
uh, symbols shouldn't be big problem. And then we will again have uh, surplus is excreted in the form of CO2, H2O, and NH3. And finally, dissipation reaction, the simplest one, uh, just take one CMOL of uh, reserve, combine with oxygen, and see how. And then what we get, so, so it's completely, it's not used to build anything. That is, in this case, reserve is not used to build anything. We're just kind of breaking it down to the minimum uh, size that we can in order to extract as much energy as possible to drive metabolic processes. So this, and what we do when we have chemical reactions where we try to balance them. And specifically in these chemical reactions, we are, what we really don't know are these stoichiometric coefficients that come with uh, oxygen, uh, with uh, carbon uh, uh, dioxide, with water and with ammonia. Whereas these yields, these Y coefficients, uh, essentially characterize the organism that we are looking at and how efficient the organism is in converting food into a uh, reserve. So that's why we have yield uh, in a transformation of food to reserve. Also, uh, how, how much uh, feces is produced in, in kind of in combinations of in one CMOL of reserve is produced, we will have YPE C moles of uh, feces. So th these, these yield coefficients there are three, uh, YXE, YPE, and uh, the third one will appear in the growth equation. So these characterize the organism and they're supposed to be, well, at least in principle, something that we know and we want to uh, express these uh, uh, stoichiometric coefficients C in, uh, as functions of uh, Ys. And that's what we do. So simple, just simple balancing of equations. Uh, pre, uh, the first, the previous slide for assimilation reaction, and then uh, this in this slide for growth and dissipation reactions. You can see that dissipation reaction is the simplest one. So the expressions that we get are uh, really easy to understand and easiest to check. So one that is, once that is done, we actually want to uh, start talking about uh, flows, flows of materials. And especially we are interested in organic materials. So that would be, again, the reserve, food, uh, structure, and feces. So essentially four uh, organic materials uh, are of interest in this picture. And what we learn, so, so the thing that we immediately learn from macrochemical re reactions and the way they are written is that um, we can connect the kind of, well, we can give a central role to the reserve. And simply, if we look at the net growth, kind of net inflow of organic material into the reserve, we see that uh, just logically, it's a flow, it should be flow uh, into reserve due to assimilation, minus flow out of reserve due to, due to growth, and minus flow out of reserve due to dissipation. So it's essentially just the definition of what we said, what we put in that schematic representation over here and the way we define the reserve. But then we can also see that uh, from a simulation reaction, it tells us that once we make one CMOL of reserve, we will have used YXE CMOLs of uh, food. So if we are making two CMOLs of reserve per unit of time, then we need to multiply Y by two. If we are making five CMOLs of reserve, then it's five times YXE is the amount of food that is necessary to, to uh, assimilate this much reserve, this much organic matter into reserve. So essentially, if the flow into reserve is JEA, then we just need to multiply Y XE by that number, and we are getting uh, flow. We, we are getting the amount of food per unit of time that is needed to build, to assimilate that much organic material into uh, reserve. Well, similar uh, logic uh, works for uh, the growth macrochemical equation where we see, okay, for each CMOL of reserve that we take to build structure, well, how much structure can we build? But well, we just multiply that, that flow of organic material out of reserve for growth. We multiply it by the appropriate yield coefficient and we get uh, the flow of material into uh, structure and similar idea for feces. So essentially we are mm, writing all organic flows just uh, as kind of functions of uh, inputs and outputs, input into and output, uh, outputs out of uh, the outputs from the result. 
But again, same logic can be uh, used for uh, inorganic flows. We just see, we can see that the flow of CO2 of carbon dioxide will again be related to how we, 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 this, this stoichiometric coefficient similar to yields. Uh, these stoichiometric coefficients tell us for each mole of reserve that we built through a simulation, well, that will be accompanied with a certain number of carbon dioxide molecules. Same for growth, same from this, for dissipation. And then it turns out that we can write all inorganic flows. So for example, uh, oxygen flow, so basically respiration rate. We can just <clears throat> write as a linear combination of uh, <coughs> flows in and uh, out of uh, the reserve. And this essentially, uh, these equations here kind of explain uh, the idea behind the method of indirect calorimetry where people simply measure, uh, for example, oxygen respiration and the, the CO2 output. And from those two measurements, uh, get an idea about uh, the whole uh, metabolism. So how is that even possible? Well, essentially, if we assume the measurement lasts for a few hours, uh, that's period during which growth is really not important. So we can just set the growth flow to zero. And then what we are left is with one equation with two unknown flows. So assimilation flow into reserve and dissipation from reserve. And the same will be from carbon dioxide measurement. Again, we will have uh, assimilation flow here as an unknown and dissipation flow is another un unknown. And we will be able to express uh, these unknowns. So we just have two equations with two, two unknowns. So geometric coefficients are known for, by balancing uh, the macrochemical equations. And uh, just from two measurements, we can actually tell pretty much everything about uh, metabolism. All right, so this covers uh, mass balancing, but now we have to uh, kind of dive into uh, thermodynamics. And um, why thermodynamics? Well, most of you, if you are trying to make a dev model for, for your favorite pet, you will be working with energies. But it is fundamental picture. From the, when we start from fundamentals, we start with mass flows. And energy flows just kind of come into the story uh, later uh, in, in this particular point, And they come into, into the picture through uh, thermodynamics. And it is thermodynamics that actually teaches us what sort of energies we are working with. So if we have a temperature T and pressure P, so it's kind of, we are just thinking about general uh, thermodynamic system. Uh, so changes in internal energy and internal energy inside the system is, is the energy of all the molecules, the bonds in those molecules, the, the movements of those molecules that are inside the system. So basically all the energy is encapsulated inside the system. And, thermodynamic system can be anything, including a living organism. So changes in internal energy are accompanied by changes in entropy and possibly expansion work. So the change of volume of the system. And uh, also, so internal energy will be changed, changed if there are exchanges, exchanges of materials uh, in and out of the system. And this is... Uh, what we have here on the, the top left equation is expressing the, this statement. So at constant, at the temperature T and pressure P changes in internal energy. So the DU stands for, well, small, small change of internal energy will be uh, caused by changes in entropy, DS, changes, possibly changes in volume, if the system is uh, expanding, and by exchanges of materials in and out. We can rewrite this equation by uh, putting the entropy term and volume term on the, uh, the left hand side and see that the change of something of a combination U plus PV minus TS. So change of all of the, this combined thing is just equal to exchanges of materials in and out. And these are when we, when we look at that model, when we build that model, we are actually looking at, uh, well, assimilation of organic material in food into reserve. And then we also look that there will be some uh, oxygen will be used during that process. And then some metabolites will be excreted during the process. 
So we are interested, when we build the model, we look at uh, exchanges of materials with the environment and then say that, okay, because some food has been eaten and assimilated into the reserve, that this food is bringing energy into reserve. So when we make that statement, we are actually, because that energy is just based on exchanges of material, doesn't have anything to do with uh, expansion or entropy changes. Uh, the, the change, energy change that is proportional to material flows is, is not internal energy, it's this combined thing over here. And that combined thing is in thermodynamics is defined as uh, Gibbs free energy. And it's one of the uh, several uh, thermodynamic state function uh, describing uh, well, the state of thermodynamic system. So, so when we are talking about energies in dynamic energy budget theory, we are talking uh, about Gibbs free energy. And to kind of put stuff into more familiar form, we are actually not looking just at differential changes. We, we usually look at time derivatives. So there will be change, small change in, in Gibbs free energy per unit of time. We see that that is equal to some proportionality constant, which is called chemical potential, times the change, so the, the exchange material, mass of exchange materials again per unit of time, which is just, which are just mass flows. Which, for which we use the letter J. And then because mass flow is multiplied by this proportionality constant, by chemical potential, we are actually getting uh, energy flow, which, we, which uh, we denote with P dot on top. So it's energy per, use, per unit of time. And these energy flows in DEB, in DEB are actually flows of Gibbs free energy. So moving forward, because we are uh, look, we are interested in assimilation, growth, and dissipation, three processes, we then want to define, and we had assimilation into reserve, so mass flows, assimilation into reserve, and then uh, growth process by using reserve to, to build structure and dissipation process to use reserve as a source of energy. Um, so these mass flows can be converted into energy flows that uh, appear, well, at least PA and PG appear in the standard the model PD is hidden. We'll soon see uh, what's the relationship with the standard stuff that is used in the dev model. But uh, yeah, the, in essence, the, the three key, so we said all both organic and well, inorganic uh, flows in dev can be uh, written as functions of mass flows into and out of reserve. And now we are converting those uh, mass flows into energy flows to get assimilation to three basic energy flows uh, in depth that is assimilation, growth, and dissipation flow. And we also, because if you're looking at, uh, well, if you're interested in food, uh, reserve structure, and feces, if these are organic compounds that are of interest to us, then we can convert masses of these uh, compounds by again just multiplying with the appropriate chemical potential we can convert them into energies and in not any energies specifically into Gibbs uh, free energies and this then leads us um, directly to uh, kind of energy formulation of uh, of that where we are saying well the amount of uh, energy obtained from food is just given by assimilation energy flow divided by uh, kappa x. This kappa x is the uh, constant uh, efficiency constant that appears you will encounter when trying to estimate the parameters. But now we can actually see that this kappa x is related to the yield of uh, reserve on food, but also uh, an important role is played by uh, chemical potentials specifically chemical potential essentially kind of measure energy content of uh, organic substances so we are seeing that the ratio of uh, how energy dense food is relative to uh, reserve is an important uh, factor that enters um, into this co efficiency constant which because it's an efficiency it just has values between zero and one well similar thing for uh, reserve for structure and uh, for feces. Growth, again, growth of structure being accompanied with constant efficiency, constant kappa G. That's a very important one and takes kind of, we often look at the value of this when we try to estimate parameters. 
And just to kind of, as a, as a side note, to connect, so the things that we have been talking about so far with the dev model that you probably know and have seen in the dev book and that you're trying to run in your simulations. So, so the, the thing is that by starting from these fundamentals, we don't really have, once, even when we have this energy formulation here, it's not useful. It, it won't generate any uh, simulation results unless we can express energy flows as functions of these state variables on the left side. So these energy in food, energy in uh, reserve, in structure, and feces, these are state variables. These are describing what the organism is, what, what its state is. And then uh, the, how state variables change, well, this is controlled by energy flows, but energy flows depend on the state of the organism. So we have to, what we try to do is write these flows as functions of state variables. And to do that in formulating the standard dead model, well, we kind of invoke scaling argu uh, arguments for simulation saying that, well, uh, food needs to go through the surface that is separating the organism and the environment. So uh, simulation has to be proportional to uh, uh, structural surface of the organism. But then if there is little food in the environment, it's not the same if there is a lot of food, which is controlled by F and then every different organism will have a different kind of efficiency of uh, different uh, digestive system or assimilation system will not be uh, equally good for different organisms. So this will be characterized. The specifics of a particular organism, uh, organism will be characterized by this parameter here. Then similar, similar scaling arguments enter into uh, equation for somatic maintenance. Maturity maintenance we derive simply as an in it, it's, it's a complete analogy to somatic maintenance, although it's a, that is not immediately seen from this form, but it is what it is. Um, then we introduce things like kappa rules and so on and so forth, all uh, with the idea to uh, write down energy flows as functions uh, of state variables. So this is the standard there, but we, we are more interested in thermodynamics. So let's just go back to uh, thermodynamics. And again, we return to the relationship for a change in internal energy that we uh, have seen on slide 23. And this relationship holds for slow thermodynamic processes that keep temperature and pressure uniform throughout the system. And if that is the case, so these are called quasi-static processes. And if this is the case, then we also know that the change in, uh, we know how the change in entropy uh, is related to uh, heat and exchange of materials again. And we can, sorry about that, we can insert this relationship right here and uh, write that the change in internal energy uh, depend, so write the change in internal energy as a function of uh, heat flow. Uh, again, work, expansion work that the organism performs and uh, exchanges, uh, exchanges of materials where now we get, uh, when we talk about heat here, then we see that uh, this chemical, so and look at the term uh, related to exchange of material, we see that chemical potential is now uh, replaced with quantity H, which is essentially sum of the chemical potential and temperature multiplied by uh, molar entropy. And the whole uh, H bar is called mol molar enthalpy. Mm -hmm kind of saying, uh, parameters saying that how much energy is contained in, uh, how much of internal energy is lost or gained by exchanging uh, materials with the environment. And this is uh, essentially formulation of uh, the first law of thermodynamics. So changes in internal energy are due to heat exchanges due to work and due to material exchanges. And when internal energy changes is in uh, essence temperature, it means that the temperature of the thermodynamic system in our case, uh, organism oftentimes temperature will change. Uh, the, the relationship that we had here, which is for the change in entropy. So change in entropy in general is, is uh, governed, is explained or described by the second law of thermodynamics. And for these particular quasi-static processes that we mentioned, uh, change in entropy is related to heat and exchange of materials. But if the processes are not quasi-static, if they are, well, irreversible, strongly irreversible, then uh, some the equality here will not hold and there will be some entropy produced uh, in the process and that is captured by this extra term here. So the second law of thermodynamics says that uh, change in entropy will be due to heat exchange with the environment, but also entropy production and exchange of materials with the environment.
All right. So this uh, brings us to, to let's let's simply try to apply uh, these laws of thermodynamics. And we will uh, assume a little bit idealized situation just for um, simplicity. We'll say, we'll look at an organism, we'll assume, okay, this organism eats some food at some point in the day, say in the morning, and then uh, this food has, uh, so due to, to exchange, food is, eating food is exchange of materials with environment, so, so this food will come with some enthalpy, it also come, will come with some entropy, uh, but then we say, okay, let's assume that the organism is pretty much resting after that. It's not growing, so the change in volume is zero. Uh, and because it's not doing much, it is simply returning, it's processing food and simply returning to its slowly processing food and simply returning to its original state, meaning that change is internal energy and we set this change in internal energy and change in entropy uh, to zero. So then if we try to apply this first law here and second law here, by putting for du change in for of internal energy zero, entropy change in entropy zero, and then say, okay, there is no uh, any expansion work. So this term is zero. So essentially what we get is that uh, exchange of heat with environment is equal to uh, entropy uh, due to exchange of materials. And from second law of thermodynamics, we get that uh, change in heat again is equal to uh, the change in so entropy due, because of exchange of materials plus uh, entropy production. And this first equation immediately gives us, so if we want to write it uh, in a more recognizable form that will often, uh, that will appear in, in web literature, uh, we'll just kind of divide this by dt and uh, note, okay, say that the change of, change of heat per unit of time is, uh, Q with a dot here, dot uh, saying that we are looking now uh, at this quantity per unit of time. And there should, I guess there should be a minus here. The minus is missing here. And then here we'll have uh, molar enthalpy uh, multiplied by dm over dt, which is just uh, a mass flow, which in that we uh, denote with j dot and dot. And then combining these two equations will also tell us what entropy production is. And we will see that entropy production, so this T sigma now, sigma with a dot, saying that we are looking at entropy production per unit of time, will just be, again, given by exchanges of materials with the environment, but instead of multiplying by molar enthalpy, we will have to multiply by chemical potential. And we know that chemical potential times mass flow is actually energy flow. So what we learn from, from this exercise is that mass flow together with molar enthalpies will give us metabolic heat, heat generation. And this is the thing that we seek. This is the thing that we want. But we also learn from uh, thermodynamics that mass flows combine with chemical potentials. And th that means energy flows. Um, flows of Gibbs free energy give us entropy production. So that's, that's, that's the lesson that we learn. And we now apply that lesson to, to a dead organism. So this was just a kind of stylized exercise for a very simple hypothetical organism. Now we are applying this exercise to a dead organism. And then the full um, uh, first law of thermodynamics will be, so again, change in internal energy. Now, here we assume that the organism is not doing anything. So internal, it's returning to initial state at the beginning of the day by not doing anything. But in, in uh, dead organisms build structure and build some reserve and that will be that will stay inside so that is a change of internal energy is uh, given by uh, flow into for flow of uh, materials into structure flow of materials in, into reserve of course these these are mass flows so they need to be multiplied by molar enthalpy um, so again First law of thermodynamics tells us about heat, uh, the relationship of internal energy and uh, heat and work that organisms do, but then exchange of materials uh, come into uh, play. So we look at materials that go in all the way there from macrochemical reactions. We know that it's food and oxygen are the things that go in, and then we have to subtract things that, that go out, that is feces, carbon dioxide, water, and nitrogen. From the second equation that we had in the previous slide from this one, we can then say for similar things, similar statement for 
um, entropy production here should be a plus. Uh, entropy production, essentially the same sort of relationship, but now instead of molar entropies, we have uh, chemical potentials. And precisely because we have these chemical potentials here, and we know we learn now that chemical potentials multiplied by mass flows give energy flows, what we can write down in terms of the usual energy flows that we work with in the standard depth model is not so much heat production, but this uh, entropy production term. And when we do that, when we write an explicit uh, equation for, for entropy production, we get this sort of uh, thing. This is the, the end result of uh, all this effort. And we see some recognizable, these uh, efficiency uh, constants um, that you recognize from the standard depth model. But then we also see a bunch of these terms in, involving ratios of chemical potentials and stoichiometric coefficients, which if you remember, we know them, we know their values from balancing macrochemical equations. Oftentimes, the work, mechanical work that organisms perform is, is not really big, but if it were big, it would be negative, simply saying that negative means that organism is performing work at the expense of environment, or on the environment. And uh, then it means, because this could be larger, more and more negative number, then uh, energy flows must compensate for this number because entropy production cannot go negative. So if this is becoming negative, then there is, if it becomes too negative, then it will overshadow these uh, other terms in the, in the, on the right-hand side and entropy production will be negative, which actually is not, this cannot happen. And we have to, in that case, uh, these flows simply have to co compensate. So at first, maybe uh, more dissipation of energy from reserve to perform this mechanical work, but then if, if work is sustained, then eventually the organism needs to assimilate some food. And then what is uh, interesting in terms of the larger picture of biophysical uh, ecology, biophysical modeling, is that for aerobic heterotrophs, uh, it's a pretty good approximation. We can approximate heat production mm, by actually calculating entropy production, which we can calculate from energy flows without really resulting to uh, mass flows. So just to remind you once again, why we did all this. Well, we did all this essentially to find this particular term here, term for metabolic heat in the heat flow balance, which is one of the balances that we, that we saw uh, in order to determine uh, the niche of, uh, our, of, of the organism of interest. And the only alternative, it's complicated, yes, it is, but the only alternative uh, to mechanistic niche modeling are statistical body size scaling relationship, and they just sever the explicit connection to mechanisms and processes. So we may be able to answer to uh, some extent the question of questions like why, why this is happening, but actually mechanisms and processes in statistical approaches uh, take a secondary role. And that's that. Thank you for your attention today and sorry for uh, taking this long time, but I hope it was uh, interesting and educational. Thank you all. Bye. <laughs>